Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Three Men of Football. All right, lads. Thomas, Simon, how are we? Hi, boys. How are we doing? All good. All good. That was literally like it was scripted. Yeah, we are getting to that point now, aren't we, in the show where it's the same every time we introduce ourselves, it's the same um, welcome. Well, this is, it's like Thomas' OCD, though, isn't it? It won't let him do it any other way. No, it, if you don't say, if you don't say my name and Simon's name first, throws me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were just, just talking about a Christmas special. What yes. are we thinking? What are we thinking about a Christmas? I mean, we're now on, what, the, the, the 11th of November? Yes. Yes. I, like just said, I just said, that would make a great Scrooge. I think I would. I think I would. Yeah, I, you may have played that before, Dad. I have played... Thanks for bringing that up. I have played Scrooge before, and uh, Phil McGuinness, who was on a couple of uh, episodes ago, he played uh, in it as well. Obviously, I was the star, and he was just my, uh, you know, uh, lackey, I was going to say, but I don't think that's the right word. I think last week you said he was working for you, didn't you? Well, he does, yeah, yeah. I carry his golf bag, and uh, he, he, uh, he's my understudy. I love it. Brilliant. Funnily enough, I seen his new advert today. Have you seen oh, it? Oh, did I? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it's so funny where he's in the. He takes a shot and then he does the point, and then he's literally in like Allerton, and there's a woman walking past with a dog. <laughs> <laughs> that, I was. Um, he, he filmed that a couple weeks ago, and it was. He had a great time, and uh, it's great to see him uh, on the Masters because that's getting showed for the Masters at the American Golf, and it'll be. And again, it's just exposure. So uh, well I mean, done. I'll be looking at him, thinking, "Why is Crouchy playing golf?" <laughs> yeah, uh, but what it does show me, I've played golf with Phil on numerous occasions and it just goes to show what editing can do. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even look good. <laughs> you know, one thing I picked up on it was that his top was a little bit tight and you could see his nipples through it. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Thomas, have you got that on your screensaver? Yeah. <laughs> you no. kept it no. for private moments. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, so today we are going to review the, the weekend action. Uh, from the Premier League, and we also have another classic Wall of Hate, which people absolutely loved last week, by the way. Uh, and Daz may just have a quiz question for us later on. I don't know, but maybe. Well, you know, you, you said get it done now, and I jumped and got it done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've just been saying before, we all just work for Thomas anyway. All right, so we're going to kick off with some comments. And there were plenty this week again. Well, actually, I'll start off by saying... Our episode from last week, which was a, a roundup episode of the Premier League and a preview of what was coming up last weekend, um, within 48 hours, I'd had 1,200 plus watches, which was uh, which was good. Well, I I don't want to say it was Thomas's French, but I think that's got a lot to do with it. People were just tuning in for the uh, to see a linguistic uh, work to learn how, to learn French, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, let, let's see what people think of it in the comments because there were a few comments about it. I'm not going to go on too much because we, we talked a little bit about it on the live last week. But uh, the first one was from Dean Booth. He said, brilliant episode again. They keep getting better. Uh, and by the way, if Thomas Morris leaves to be an actor or Darren leaves to become a stand-up comedian, I'm your man. I don't cost much, just a bag of Haribo and a curly whirly. Uh, hang on. Simon, you won't leave because you're the glue. Smiley <laughs> face. Uh, great to see my petition that was signed by one person for the quizzy quiz type quiz question worked. Happy days. Keep up the good work, especially the live episodes as you don't know what is going to be said. Thomas. <laughs> I don't like them. Brilliant. Yeah, I don't like, like them. them. I don't I... like them because I can just see that you're on edge. Yeah. I like these because I know by the magic of editing. Any stupid thing <laughs> I made is gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very, he, he's very expressive there, wasn't he, with his yeah, voice? Yeah, that, that, now, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, the acting's coming on heaps and bounds. All right, so the next one is from Alan Wynn uh, about Roy Keane. He said, Roy Keane provides great comedy value on Aguero. And this was an absolute classic. When he came back from injury, I don't know what size shorts he was wearing. He's piled on the pounds. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't care what he says. I thought Roy Keane was brilliant on that. Yeah. It was excellent. Yeah. Um, okay. Then Dan Watson, this was actually today. Uh, someone posted a picture of the fact that Gomez may be injured. And we're still waiting to find out what that is. Um, but his comment was brilliant. It was, when is the minute silence for his injury? Well, it's funny <laughs> you should mention that. 
Yeah, we, we have got a concert, Dan. Um, if you're interested, we're, we're doing it in the old Swan area of Liverpool, outside the Masons, to try and get Liverpool a centre half. So if you're interested in co- comparing it, Dan, give us a shout. We'll sort of. Dan, I want to play. Can right. he play? Can he play? Yeah, he's a decent footballer. He plays in the Czech Republic. We yeah, can all we go all say that. He's an Arsenal side. fan, though, isn't he? So, I, mean, I, yeah. I, I saw a comment off him regarding Arsenal this week in Villa. He said something about he didn't want to see me. Yeah, he I, said I, he was I, going to be hiding from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's get to that later on. All right, so then I've got another one here, and I've got a word. I've got to read this verbatim. Okay, so this was from uh, the office of E. Macron. Uh, we would like to draw your attention to a legal letter which will be with you in the coming days. Obviously, I got worried at this stage. We feel we need to take action after Mr. Thomas Morris represented himself as a fluent French speaker. We can assure you that the words spoken on the recent episode, which got 1,250 views, were neither French or any other language we know of. We will be seeking a court order to ensure this does not happen in future. Yours sincerely, the office of... E. Macron, which I'm a little bit worried about, to be fair, because your French was shocking. It was outstanding, to be honest, considering I'd never just seen it until I'd read it off the paper. <laughs> All right, so the, the next one came in as well, and this was uh, from R. Stone. We would like to offer you a 50% voucher for our French for Dummies series, as we notice you <laughs> <in> the language. <laughs> Oh, you spent hours thinking of them, haven't you? <laughs> and that's from Rosetta Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Minutes. It was, it was so easy. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I want to know who his gag writer is because they're getting more money oh, than me. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and it, was, uh, it got an awful lot of comments on Facebook. And just generally, I was getting all sorts of texts through the week about how ridiculous it was. And your French was amazing. But the fact that we got that many views means it got picked up by YouTube. And I don't know how it got picked up. It might have been the title. It might have been the description. I, no idea. But it just, one day, it just went through the roof and we got loads of views. But uh, obviously, we're all attributing it to your French speaking or your lack of French speaking. Well, I think you've been a bit negative, as always, Simon. The best part was the Marnie part. That was absolute genius. And the, yeah. the French speakers that we know and listen to the show were like, how did he come up with that? <laughs> Maybe you've made up your own language. Because it sounded safe. like Marnie, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, sounded like. Yeah, so just go with it. They don't speak that type of French anymore, Simon. It's a, it's a very exquisite, you know, exclusive dialect. You know, like the Catalonia and Barcelona. It's from a small village south of Paris, if you will. Culture, and, uh, the, it does. Culture. Yeah, yeah, cultured, yeah. Okay, so let's get to uh, the the football from the weekend, and it was another it was another cracker. Loads of controversy. In fact, we did a live on Saturday morning, and we talked about the two games from Friday. But we'll just run through them very quickly. One of them was absolutely crap, which was Brighton versus Burnley. I think we we agreed on Friday on Saturday morning that actually no one watched that game. Did you just watch the highlights? Yeah, yeah watched just the highlights. highlights. It was not good at all. Not finished nil nil. Yeah, any of the highlights weren't great. No, you know, well, Brighton any... should have won though. Unfortunately, do you think? Yeah, definitely. Brighton should have won. They had enough chances. Welbeck just didn't have a shooting boots on. He had, he had three good chances in front of goal with the goalie to beat, and a striker worth any salt would have put but, one of them away. But Thomas, you... come on. But but did you not find Thomas though? Welbeck's always been about a bit like that in his career. You know, he's very hit and miss. Even when he was at like Arsenal, United. He's never really been prolific. And I think Brighton is a massive gamble. Is it Brighton he, he went to? Yeah, yeah. That's a massive gamble for them to take someone like him because he's injury prone. He'll probably only play half the season and he needs to be scoring goals for them. He, they can't afford to, to have someone who's going to miss three chances like that. Yeah, but he's goal, he's a, one, he's a goal threat that they haven't really got. Two, generally, he will put one of them chances away. So I just think... It's a big miss. He was in the box. He had the goalie to beat. He had clear sight to goal. Generally, you know, a number nine, a number 10 in any side in the Premiership, be it the bottom side or the top side, they would have put one of them chances away. They were decent chances. And it's points dropped definitely for Brighton. And it would give him a little bit of breathing space above the top, you know, the bottom three. Yeah. 
they don't look great. I mean, we had the scores we had were uh, I had Brighton 2 0, Thomas had Brighton 1 0, and Darren, you had Brighton 2 1. Um, but obviously, not, not anything in it, 0 0, boring game. And then the next game was Southampton Newcastle, which Southampton won 2 0. Shea Adams scored again, uh, and Stuart Armstrong, great finish by Adams, by the way. Yeah. And I also thought Walcott played really well as well. Yeah. Big, big. He took a chance there, hasn't he? Have they took, have they took all his wages on? Because I know he was on big wages at Everton. I don't know whether it's supplemented by Everton. Oh, is yeah, it? I think it might be 50 50, Thomas. Oh, I okay. think that was the chart, wasn't it? Because that was done on the last day, wasn't it? And, and the yeah. issue they were having was over the was over the the wages. So I'm I'm sure Everton are supplementing it because he's not in the team. He's not going. He wasn't going to get in the Everton team. So, so going there, that's his boy at club, isn't it? He went there. He yeah. went he went to Arsenal from there, didn't he? I think it's a good move for him. He wasn't getting a lot of game time at Everton, and it suits the game. They play a lot on the counter attack against the lesser teams, and they really, you know. He really push on, and with space, Walcott is a threat because he's so quick. Problem he's got is too many injuries, and he has too many games where he doesn't do nothing. Yeah, so. yeah. I think I think Walcott came onto the scene from Southampton to Arsenal. Never expecting great things. Unfortunately, he never really materialised into the player that we everyone hoped he would be. Certainly for England, uh, I think where he went the World Cup, did he? When he was seventeen or something, didn't he go the World Cup? Yeah. But again, what that does, that just heightens expectations and he never fulfilled them. Is that his move from Arsenal to, to Everton was seen as a, as a positive step for him in terms of he'll get game time and it didn't work out again. As you say, Thomas, too many injuries has cost him. And I think um, one of the massive things for him was his final touch, isn't, his final ball in isn't always great. He, he wanted to play more central when, when he went to Everton and it was just wasn't going to work out. He... Um, I just think he's always going to be a nearly player. I think Southampton suits him because the expectations aren't as high. And, and so the counter-attack suits him. I think it's a good move. Whether he'll last the full season uh, playing is, is something questionable. Yeah, I think the, the reality is that uh, that move to Everton should have been the move that worked for him. But, but Everton have stepped up, up. So Everton have gone up a gear and uh, have turned themselves into a much better side. They're now, you know, a, a team that's going to be challenging for Europe, whereas he's not a player that needs to be in a team that's challenging for Europe, which was clear when he was at Arsenal. So I think that's where he struggled. That's, that's why it's got to the stage where he's had to go and do something else. But I think that'll be a really good move for him, and I think he'll fit into their team. I also think that he will feed an awful lot of chances to Shea Adams and Danny Ings as well. So I think he'll do well for them. Yet to be seen, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but he certainly looks like he'll, he'll settle in well because he was good at the weekend. Just on that side, it was great to see Southampton top of the league because I think it was the first time he'd been there in 50 years or something. Um, and I think when you look back five, six, seven years ago when they were in the Premier League and uh, to come through there and, and to stick with the manager to go top of the league, even for a short while, it was a great achievement and hopefully they'll continue to do well. Yeah, I mean, that's Villa and Southampton have been top of the league this year. Villa, Everton, Southampton, Tottenham. I just wanted to yeah, mention Villa. All right, Thomas, <laughs> leave, leave it, Thomas, leave it. <laughs> yeah, he's going to start now, Daz. <laughs> okay, so then uh, we come to Saturday and the first game was Everton versus Man United. Uh, finished 3-1 to United. Um, actually, let's before we go to that, let's see what we had for Southampton Newcastle. Uh, I had Newcastle 1-0. Uh, Thomas, you had it 2 2, and Darren, you had it 1 1. So we were all wrong. Yeah, Everton, Man United, Saturday morning, 3 1 to United. Um, Bernard scored, who I thought actually was really good right throughout the game. And then Fernandez scored two, and Cavani came on and scored right at the end. But there were a couple of things in that game that really stood out. The first being uh, Pickford's mistake. And then I heard someone else saying that it wasn't a mistake, which I found really odd, because they said he was being pushed by Harry Maguire. But literally, Harry Maguire just had his hand in his chest. It didn't look like he was pushing him. And generally, I thought Everton were, were really poor. United played well, Everton played poor, and it was an easy win in the end. Yeah, it was, it was a massive win for United. I think Ollie was feeling the pressure. And actually, the players looked as though they were, were playing for him, um, which surprised me. I think Everton just was slow to start and never really moved on from that. Um, again, Pickford didn't have anything to do. Then suddenly, his concentration, he's making, making a mistake. Um, 
I I don't see why Pickford had to go for that ball. If he wanted to go for it, just push it out. Don't try and be clever and keep it in play because it nearly cost them massively. Because again, they were talking about his tackle on, on Maguire after he dropped the ball. He kicked um, it in the chest. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just thinking, you're giving the referees and, and, and VAR an opportunity to make a decision that didn't need to be made. But again, Everton moved the ball too slow uh, on, on Saturday. The, the movement wasn't great. And so when, when you're someone's on the ball and if your movement's not, not good and quick and sharp, then the pass isn't sharp and the pass isn't quick. And I just think Everton were very laborious, I think. And I just think they need to... They need to almost Everton start on the front foot and almost go for it for 20 minutes because that sets the tempo of the game. And, and United, they look good because they were up against nothing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't know how true this stat is. Everton haven't won a game when Richarlison hasn't played since he's been there. And if that's true, oh. that's ridiculous. Uh, Everton were very slow. They moved the ball really slow. They weren't as competitive as they usually are. They got a good goal. They had a, a, a little spell. And then straight away, United just kicked in. Uh, took over the game. Dominated possession. Dominated the ball. Dominated the pitch, really. Uh, Harry Maguire has since come out and said that it wasn't a foul on him by Pickwood. It, it was a foul by Harry Maguire himself on, on Pickwood, which made him lose his balance. And that's why he got a kick. Are you saying Pickwood or Pickford? I don't know, whatever. This is whatever it is. <laughs> Little arms. I've just seen just seen the guy. Who was the guy that played in goal for Carroll? Was it Man United? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it Carroll? Roy, yeah. Roy Carroll. That's the one. I've just seen him on doing a goalkeeping analysis on Sky Sports before and about always watching your hands and having your hands in your eye shot so that your, your hands react to what you see. And I was thinking, how can you say that about Pickford? He can't see his hands, his hands are that low. <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking about Pickford then, about Pickford being really brilliant shot stopper. And I was just thinking, he may be if the ball's hit at him. But anywhere else, you know, he, he's just not very good, is he? I can't see how, he, how he's still England's number one. But thoroughly deserved win and a bit of class from Everton. Uh, I don't know if you've seen where they pull yeah. up about Marcus Rashford and thanking him for all that he's done for the kids around the country. Superb. Uh, and that was class. And I can, you know, if by the time football gets back around to Anfield and we play Man United, I'm sure he'll get a clap off the cop as well if there's any fans on the ground. Superb. He's done brilliant. Yeah, he's done a great job. Uh, and and Daz, you, you work in a school, you know how, uh, how poverty in and around Liverpool impacts, impacts kids. Um there was loads of stuff going on around your school area as well with um, helping kids uh, get fed throughout throughout the half term, wasn't it? Yeah, the, uh, Liverpool as, as a club, uh, they have uh, a, a scheme called like I think it's Red Neighbours or something it was, and, and they delivered uh, not just to our school but to lots of schools around Kirby and, and, and beyond and and uh, nurseries. They delivered food parcels. Um, that would last a couple of days for, for families, vulnerable families. And it's nice to see them putting a bit back in the community. And, and Rashford, what he has done, he's highlighted the need for something to happen. But also he's highlighted the fact that other footballers have come out now and, and helped locally as well. You know, and um, I think that's great. You know, I, I, I work in a tough area with tough kids who are brilliant. Um, but there is poverty. There is poverty yeah. out there. And I think until you work with it or see it every single day, you don't know it's there. Because we all, you know, live in our bubbles, if you like, and I don't mean that because of COVID, because you don't see what goes on beyond your front door quite often. And I think what Rashford has done is highlighted to the the media, he's highlighted to the nation, and you know, Boris had to do something about it because of pressure, and it was a PR exercise by Boris, but actually, it's going to help a lots and lots of of children. Yeah, I mean, I think Rashford got to the stage where he didn't care whether it was a PR exercise or not, as long as no. he got the yeah, right yeah. decision there. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. I think the, the thing about Liverpool as well, uh, and this can be is true about a lot of places, but it's filled with proud people who don't want to admit when they're struggling as well, which I think is a real problem. Because the reality is that there are people out there who will help. And if, but if people don't know... Um, and at times it takes for people to open your eyes a little bit for you to have a look because you don't see it, you're right, Daz, you just live in your own little world and you get through your own days and yeah. you don't really think about what other people are dealing with, but people are dealing with horrific situations at the moment. And 
what Liverpool Football Club, Everton Football Club, people like Rashford, other football clubs around the country, and then also the local football clubs in and around Liverpool uh, and the North West have done for the food banks and, and how they've given back to charities in, in, the, in the cities has been amazing. Love to see what the clubs have done, the amateur clubs have done around Liverpool. It, it speaks to the type of people that are in this city uh, and all of the good that is, that is there. You know, we, we, get, uh, we get spoken about a lot in a negative way, but there's so much good going on and it was great to see some of that get played out in the, in the press as well. Okay, so the next game was Crystal Palace versus Leeds at Crystal Palace, and we had this totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> Does that not surprise me? <laughs> we had, well, I mean, you did that, definitely. Uh, Crystal Palace beat Leeds 4 1, and I had it Leeds winning 3 1. Thomas had it 2 0 for Crystal Palace. He's a giant. Daz, you had it 3 0 to Leeds. Um, by the way, we were we were out on the Everton, the Everton scored other than Thomas as well. So Thomas had two 0 United. I had three one Everton. You had two one Everton. Dad. So I'm starting to dislike Thomas's tips. Yeah, he got two right. But in that game, it was a, a, a decent game as well. So Scott Dan scored. Eze uh, Costa scored an own goal. That was a weird own goal as well from a really acute angle. IU scored as well, and then Bamford scored. But the thing that stood out in that game was I I think Bamford has come into his own. By the way, he's been brilliant recently. Scored a great goal in that game, but he also had one off one uh, call for offside, and I don't know how you can call that offside. That's probably the worst one I've seen all year. He, he, yeah, he I, got called offside because he was pointing where he wanted the ball. Well, it's taught a lesson: don't point. We've always said that in classes. It's rude to point, uh, but I, I think Ali McCoy was doing the game for Sky Sports, and um, he, being a striker, he obviously was always going to uh, go go for the uh, the, the strike. Because but he was saying he does not know how it's being given, and then Jeff Stelling came on and said he doesn't know how it's being given. If if people in the game, Ali McCoy, who's played the game, and other people pundits around the country have said we don't know how it's given, there's a massive issue in the game. But the issue is always going to be the interpretation of the rules, and you, you can swap change rules all the time. But I think this needs to be some that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later, because actually, if Bamford had got that goal then Leeds might have had a bit more of a comeback. Yeah. And, and I think, I think we, we, need to be, we need to be looking at VAR and we need to be saying, it's not VAR anymore. It's coming down to people in terms of the rules and, and making those decisions. Because you're always going to have the, the referees' the decision. You're always going to have the, the, is it Stockley Park? Those yeah. people in, in those Stockley Park make decisions. We need to stop and, and, and give the strikers the benefits of the doubt. And I'm not saying... This is millimetres. It's not like he's off by three, three yards or three metres. This is millimetres. And, and if it comes down to, we're getting too mechanical with the game now. We're getting too stop start. We're not letting the flow of the game happen. And it's ruining the game. Yeah, I totally uh, Just agree. on the rules, Dan. It's, we talked about it, I'm sure, last week or on the live. It's as soon as you pass the elbow to the bottom of the, the shirt, if that was in the offside position. So that's what he's been called offside for. So even though his body was a foot behind the play and when he's leaned forward, his actual shirt where you can, where it meets sort of your elbow point was in front. And that's where they've taken the measurements off because apparently you can now score with the top of your arm past your elbow. Yeah. But do we think if the ball had hit him there and gone in, they wouldn't call it a handball? Of well, course, of course they would. Yeah. yeah. But they're saying that's not handball anymore. Yeah. And you can score from that part of your arm. So it's it's ridiculous. He was a good yard behind the play. It was a great goal. And to be fair to him, I know they, they were outplayed over the game, but he scored a cracking goal. It was the, good, wasn't the, it? The, the touch off his chest, absolute inch perfect into his path to then smash it past the goalie. Superb. And uh, he surprised me, really surprised me how, how well he's done. Uh, and there's a lot of weight on his shoulders and there was a hell of a lot of pressure because of how poor he performed for other teams in the Premier League in the past. And also at times last year where you brought it up earlier in one of the podcasts that about um, missing too many chances in games. But because he was in the Championship, you get them extra chances to make right on your wrongs in the game. And in the Premiership, you don't get as much, maybe one chance, two chances. 
and uh, he, he he looks good to be fair to him. And the, if he stays fit, Leeds will have a chance of staying up because I know they're leaking goals. But if you're scoring goals, which is the hardest thing for teams at the bottom to do at times. Well, you say you say about Bamford as well. We've just been talking about Brighton and Welbeck and the yeah. difference between a striker who's taken three chances and not scoring. And Bamford, and he had a couple of chances in the game, but not not a not a, a crazy amount. But scored two goals, both yeah. of them should have been, should have stood. And he just looks like he's gaining in confidence, but he's also he's a bit cheeky as well, which I really like. So he seems like he seems really clean cut. But did you see him when he scored his goal? He went straight over to the linesman, and then as he's running away, he's he's, he's doing this to him while you're putting your flag up, <laughs> which I loved that. But he, he did it. I started laughing. I mean, you know, he was he was doing it. <laughs> But I, I really like him. I think he's a quality player. I agree with you. I think there is a chance that Leeds could stay up if he keeps scoring. But you, you can't let in four goals against Crystal Palace. I mean, they're poor. Yeah. They're really bad. And Leeds didn't look great at the back at all. They looked good going forward, looked crap at the back. Yeah, I, th- I think with Palace, you're always just going to get this steady team. You're always going to get... a. a uh, a well organised Roy Hodgson side. You're never going to get the uh, the flair that we see with some of the other the teams. You're never going to get that because he likes the pe- people to work hard in midfield. He has one or two players like Zaha and, and one or two others who add that little bit extra. But they all work hard. They all know the the, the job and they all stick to the job as best he can. And he, he almost like says, "This is how we're going to do it. We're going to stay tight and we're going to try and get something out the game." By, by on either counter-attack or, or a set-piece. And fair play to Palace, they put the chances away. And, but I think Leeds are missing Phillips in the middle of the park. I think since he's gone out with his injury, they haven't been the same. And I was speaking to uh, Laura and work who's a, a Leeds fan. Uh, I mean, she's got other problems as well, but she is a Leeds fan. And um, <laughs> she, um, she was saying how Phillips almost stays and protects that <laughs> back four. And since he's gone out the team, no coincidence, they've leaked goals. Yeah, he's 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 the the classic holding midfielder for them. But also, maybe that's a uh, maybe that's the wrong way to describe him as well. Maybe he plays a bit more conventional because he gets forward as well and supports the the, the play. So, he, I think he's just solid. He's a solid midfielder who could play anywhere in that midfield. You know, you if you play a diamond in midfield, he could play the attack on midfield role. He could play the hold midfield role. He's just a quasi footballer. First time I saw him, I didn't think he looked that great. But he's grown on me week after week as he's played. I think he's just looked better and better. Maybe he's settled in, um, but he's a he's a he's a quality player, and they're definitely missing him. Um, so on to the next game. The next game was uh, Chelsea versus Sheffield United, uh, and we had this. Uh, what were the scores, time? Because I think uh, I think the scores were, were all right. When you you got the, the the winner? Yeah. So uh, Chelsea. Sheffield United, I had it 2 0 for Chelsea. Oh, that's unlucky. No, that's unlucky, Simon. That's very unlucky, that. Thomas had it 1 1. It, it, it was for a little bit. <laughs> and Darren, you had yeah. it 4 1 to Chelsea. Sorry, I just, my AP slipped then, Simon. You was had that? it 4 1 to Chelsea, Daz. Oh, excellent. Well and done. And it finished 4 1 to Chelsea, strangely enough. <laughs> um, so Abram scored, Chilwell scored a, a decent goal. Um, it wasn't great in terms of what he did, but he did really well to. Get in a back post and, and get it finished what, off off his what knee. What are you doing? No idea. Silver scored, Werner scored, and Emma Goldra got a, a lucky goal as well, uh, deflected off him. Um, I thought Chelsea still looked very shaky at the back, but looked brilliant going forward. And Zayic was unbelievable in the game. He was just, it was almost like he was running the game, yeah. and his delivery is outstanding. Set up so yeah. many chances for, I think. They were saying there hasn't been a player that set up more chances in a game in the Premier League so far. Um, Zayac is the highest this year. Where did they get him from? Ajax. Ajax. He's, he's a qu- what was interesting is um, Abraham's goal. He scuffed the shot and it went to the corner. Um, the Chil- Chilwell's goal, great ball in, and he almost didn't want to collide with the goalkeeper, and he sort of put his knee there and it went in. But the, the third goal was, I think, the corner. I think it was silver. Oh, yeah. Now, if you, if you watch the corner kick, um, what Chelsea did very well there is they blocked the, the uh, Sheffield United defender who was marking silver, which allowed him to get a yard or two. And he, he was clear through and he was never going to miss. And I just thought, that's so unlike Sheffield United getting done like that. Because normally they're the ones who are doing the block and they're the ones who are putting the men in front of the other men to stop that. 
but quite clever by, by Chelsea. Obviously, it was a set piece they'd worked on uh, because they almost did this sort of bus stop where they had the two players and then Orsley, Chelsea's, the lad that he was blocking was step in front yeah. and allowed Silva to, to, to run behind and, and, and get a yard or two in. I think it was Joe Egan who was trying to, to track him. Uh, I thought, I, I like it when, when people have practised that set piece and it comes off. I think that's good training ground. Um, I think they've worked on that. Whether they can do that again, uh, they'll have to think of something else. Can people get onto that quite quick? Well, it shows that he's still dealing with some of the basics uh, at the at the training ground, as opposed to just letting the the flair players come in and do a, do have a couple of shots at the keeper or something. He's actually working on things that are going to help them during the game. I, I thought that was a great goal. Yeah, I did. It, it worked really well. They they obviously planned it, and it was a, a great header. But it only it only happens if you commit to it. So the ball in, that the, the, there has to be some sort of signal. And that ball in needs to be exactly where he needs to put it. Because if you do it and you, you get it wrong and you've blocked them once, you won't be able to do it again because they'll yeah, get onto it. Absolutely. So it's almost like you've got to time it to do that ball in has to be right. Yeah. Why did you call it the bus stop, Darren? Is it because two buses come at once? <laughs> You know, he's, he's probably got it in his coaching manual. The uh, When the volume four comes out of uh, the five fundamentals, Thomas, that's in it. You know what I wish you did? I want to boot call the five fundamentals because you'd be rich the amount of promotion that you do for it. <laughs> yeah, but Thomas, I promote it all the time, but no one bugger buys it. <laughs> I buy it, mate, because I'm your mate. Thanks, mate. I'll get you a free copy. Uh, sign it. <laughs> yeah, I will. Push it. Uh, I just want to say, Darren... You drinks that poor goalie. Is it Ramsdale? Yeah. yeah. You're only talking about him in the last podcast. You jinxed him. <laughs> what was he doing? What was yeah. he doing? For the whole flight of the ball, everything was his fault. He could have come and took it out the air. He could have come and took it in the six-yard box. He could have stepped right across Chilwell and got the ball. He didn't do nothing. And literally, Chilwell just knocked it in. Like He was like, oh, thanks very much. Absolutely pathetic. Do, do you not think that in the same game, he was brilliant and he was terrible in the same game? He made some great saves, did really well. And I was thinking, as the game's going, I was thinking, he's doing really well here after us talking about him last week. And then it just went downhill really quickly. Because he yeah, was I both. Think at, uh, like, like some, of his, some of his passing <laughs> was not very good either, was it? No, no I, I think what especially the Chilwell uh, one, he, he, he stayed on his line. And he should have come out for that and committed to it. But it's about watching the flight of the ball. And, and the, the ball was quite flat coming in. And, and as a keeper, you've got to almost anticipate that and get out early and make a decision. Because as long as you stay on your line, the closer it's getting and you're inviting people to make that run. But you're right, Thomas, he should have come out and collected that. But it was certainly no fault for the third goal. That was just a great error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was good. We're going to have uh, people phoning in or messaging. Just when did Darren turn into Graham Soonis? <laughs> <laughs> this go hand, home. you should go for this hand because. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next game uh, was West Ham versus Fulham, and uh, West Ham won one nil. We had, I had West Ham one nil. I got uh, wrong. Tom, Thomas had Fulham one nil because he loves Fulham these days, and Darren had West Ham three one. Um, so that's Susak scored in the ninety first minute. But the big things from the game was the first one was Luckman's missed penalty. <laughs> what was he doing? But I mean, it, I, I think if I watched match of the day and Gary said, if you're going to take a penalty like that, you've got to score. Just yeah, thanks for that, Gary. Yeah. J.R. He missed one, one of he them missed in one, our final. Yeah, he did, yeah. Did the same thing. Dinked it around to the goalie's arms. The goalie didn't move. Yeah. yeah. Thomas, we're over that now, though, aren't we? No, we're not. <laughs> no, I've never forgotten that. But that was that was terrible. Um, but then the other thing that I, that I found really odd as well was um, for the goal, Halla has got to be offside. If in the Aston Villa game, um, who was it? Who was offside? It was uh, Barkley. Was offside, oh, yeah. was offside for the for for the goal that was disallowed. Literally exactly the same. In fact, I'd argue that Barkley was more out of the way than Halla was, and. The, the goal in the in the West Ham game stood. The goal in the Villa game didn't stand. I, again, the, the rules being misinterpreted. Yeah, and, and you, all you want is consistency. That's all you want as, as, as a player. 
just knowing the consistency. But just just on that uh, fallen penalty, I thought Mitrovic was the penalty taker. Was he not? Was he gone off? Or has he gone off? Yeah. But, but even so, I just think that decision that Luckman's made to try and dink it to be a sm- I'm going to say smart ass because that's what he did. Have you saw? I know, I know. We'll have we'll have letters here. Um, but he is, and you've almost got to say, Fulham aren't going to get many chances in the game. They need to put that away. And I just think, what are you doing? You've made the poor decision. And you could see uh, the Fulham manager afterwards was absolutely livid because they'd have won that game and, and, and three more points. They wouldn't. They'd just, they'd just conceded, Darren. Oh, I'd be sorry. It was the 95th minute or something when he got the penalty. They'd scored in the 91st. But oh, okay. They, I thought they got, they got them a point. Yeah, they got them yeah. a point. Yeah, but it's a, it's a terrible decision, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, I've missed penalties in my time, as you know, Tom. But uh, yes, well, no, I would never forgive you. But I, I haven't done <laughs> one of them. No, to be honest, I think in in any game of football, unless the the the, the result is out is already is already sorted, I've fun with them all day. You know that time in Barcelona actually passed it. Yeah, because uh, they were trying to get Suarez the golden boots or something where yeah. the uh, Messi passed it to him. No, he tried to pass it. Messi tried to pass it to Neymar, and Suarez ran in and scored. <laughs> uh, honestly, it was he was he was trying to pass to Neymar. Oh, I didn't realize Suarez I thought, scored it. Thought he was trying to pass it to Suarez. So <laughs> he was uh, I think you've got to put your head down, and you've got to you know the best penalties. Harry Kane's very good at penalties. Julian Dick style. You pick a spot, Stephen Gerrard was very good. You pick a spot and you leather the ball, whether it be top, you know, right down the middle or in one. Middle or bottom. Yeah, anywhere, as long as it's the net. Top, middle or bottom, like being on my striker. Lucky with Michael Barrymore here. So it's a good it's a good penalty if it hits the net, Thomas. It, it's the best penalty. Brilliant, okay. <laughs> That's coaching genius, that. that That's that volume you, five. You should add that, or you should add that to make it the sixth fundamental. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So then we go to uh, Sunday, West Brom Tottenham, which finished one nil Tottenham, and this was the first game that Keane, uh, Kane, Bale, and Son had played in the same same game. We had, I had Tottenham three nil, Thomas had Tottenham three nil, and Darren had Tottenham four nil because you thought they would run away with it. Um, I, I thought it was a great goal from Kane. Nice little header over the keeper. Um, and they play pretty well, not as well as they normally do, but I think it's a good win for them. I'm not going to lie. I watched that game in bed because I was hungover and I can't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the goal. I can't remember a thing. So I he, the goal was, uh, the cross came in, keeper come out behind Kane and he just lifted it over him. Decent okay. goal. Yeah, what, what I found interesting is that I didn't find Tottenham as fluent as they normally are. I, I don't know whether that was because um, they had three up top who all wanted to, to get involved almost too much at times and they were all making the same run. They were all coming for the ball at the same time. I, I just feel, you know, Kane and Son had, uh, had a little bit of uh, momentum there with playing alongside each other. You put Bale in the mix maybe at the wrong time and, and it's just upset that the balance of that, I don't know. But, but I do feel Tottenham, under uh, Mourinho, will take a 1-0 win every week. Where you have uh, Klopp and where you have Pep almost wanting to play this exuberant football where it's fluent and everyone interchanges and it's quick pace. And I think Mourinho is the opposite of that. I think he just wants results and it's results driven. And that's why they will do well because he'll get people into work hard which will allow the three or four flair players to do what they do. He will, but I, I think at West Brom... Away to West Brom as well. It's you, you, you take anyone's going to take a one 0 win. We'd like to win by more, but you take a one 0 win there um, because that's the kind of banana skin that you could slip up on. But I also think they haven't quite figured out how they're meant to play together. You know, we talked about Chelsea early on in the season and, and the fact that they were just not fired, and now all of a sudden they look like a totally different team. But I also think you've got to figure out where the three of them fit into a three, or you change the formation of the midfield to accommodate one of them to play in an attack and midfield role and then play two conventional forwards. Personally, I think that they'd be much better setting up like Liverpool do with three forwards with Kane down the middle and Son and Bailey the side of them. I think that's where actually you'll get something out of it. Imagine the uh, amount of ball you're going to get into the box for Kane 
And then also, you know, Bale and Son can switch at any time and can cut in and, and find a top corner. I just think that gives them a bit of, and maybe, that, maybe that's what they're working towards, but that gives them something that the majority of teams in the Premier League just don't have. Yeah, I, I also think Bale isn't quite fully fit at the moment, as sharp as he'd like to be. But I think that he got 90 minutes, did he, or near enough 90 minutes uh, against West Brom. I think that'll do him the world of good. There's now an international break. So he'll go away with, with Wales and then he'll get game time there, I would imagine. But I think once, once Bale is, is on fire and they've figured out the system, I totally agree with this, Simon. I think they need to look to play the Liverpool way, uh, if you like. And I think he, he'll do that. He will do that, but he'll also expect a work rate from Bale and he'll yeah. expect the work rate from Son to do that track and back at times. And they might do it where the, the opposite side, so if Bale's come back, then Son won't track back as much because they'll still have the, the three in midfield plus Bale as the fourth. Um, but, but I do think... Tottenham still looks suspect defensively. Um, I still think you can get at Tottenham a little bit. Um, and I think when they could play up against City and Liverpool, uh, they, they might find it a little bit difficult. But do you not think that, will, that might, might hurt them, what you just mentioned there? That's so if the way they've been playing is they've been playing with two forwards, Son and Kane. And what tends to happen is Kane is dropping into the number 10 role leaving Son up top or Son is just playing off around him and, and picking up the space. But what that means is that they've then got nine men in, in amongst the game, if you like. If they don't get a system that works for them and if they're not good enough at pressing the ball high up the pitch and keeping other teams defending and playing on their terms, then they're going to struggle. Because then all of a sudden they've lost a defensive player or a someone who's going to be in the game all the time defensively and they've compromised them and, and they've, they've got to put an extra forward in. Now, I think that's a, a good thing to do, but that's not the Mourinho way. So I think that that's where they could struggle. If they, if they try and play the way Liverpool do and they don't get it right, they could go to pot because, I don't, as you're, you're right, I don't think they're as strong as maybe they need to be at the back. They haven't got, they haven't got the three midfielders to do the job, I don't think. No. What is not it, as strong um, uh, Winks and Domelay and, and, uh, and I don't know who the other guy is. Be, um Le Celso maybe or Dembele? No, no, no. He's not there anymore. Years ago, I don't know. Uh, with regards, oh, the, uh, Stephen uh, Bergwijn normally plays up front it, and play in midfield. Who's the guy they got from um, Southampton? Hogar or someone? Oh, Hoiberg. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, Hoiberg and um, and and Dombele are decent players. Yeah, and Winks has Winks has got better, so you could play those three, but they're not, maybe not not good enough to just play in a three across the middle because that then you've got to have really good fullbacks as well. Yeah, L L the Liverpool system is is designed for the athletes and freak athletes that we've got that literally kill themselves every week, and I don't think you know I, I see Harry Winks on the ball and I think he's got a nice touch and uh, he. he He's a good all-round player, but I don't think he's got the, the aggression and the desire to be pressing and hunting like Liverpool's midfield does. No. And certainly Ndomale, uh probably pronounced that wrong. But again, he's only just coming to the side because he had a full out with Mourinho because he didn't fancy it. And all the working hard and the trying to do whatever he did. So I just think you've got to be careful. I, I, I think the system that they're playing before Bale come in, where, like Simon said, where... Kane was dropping off and they had the threat of Son going in behind would work every day of the week rather than what they, them going three up top. But, but I think what will probably end up happening is, is that he will change between a 4-4-2 a and a 4-3-3 and Bale would either play in the midfield in a 4-4-2 or as the third forward depending on who they're playing. But if they're sensible about the way they do it, against the weaker sides, they could do the 4-4-3 and it could work. But against the better sides, they're not getting away with it because there'll be too many gaps up and down the wings. You think about them playing that formation against Liverpool, we'd absolutely hammer them because they're just not good enough. Yeah. I, I also think that the, the formation and the players needs to evolve over time. So Liverpool, when Klopp came in, that formation evolved because of the players as well. And he, he wanted to get the best out of the players. And he bought players then for the system he wanted to play. I'm waiting for the word. I'm waiting for the word that you always use. For me... No, and identity. They haven't got an identity, you see. I think, <laughs> but I think I think on the mean on the Mourinho, they are getting an identity Definitely. of 
They they will grind out results against the West Broms and the Fulhams and the West Dams of this team because they have a, a, a quality going forward. But I do think against the top sides, I think if Liverpool, Man City, dare I say, you know, um, a, a Chelsea at the moment, if they're going at Tottenham, then I think their defence centre halves aren't particularly strong enough to cope with the runners of Liverpool, maybe City and, and Chelsea. Well, I'm disappointed in you, Daz, then. I really thought I'm he was going to say Villa, then. How did you not say Villa when you talked about the top teams? That is disappointing. <laughs> you've had, you've, let, you've hey. let me down, you've let Thomas down, you've let the listeners down, you've let Aston Villa down, but most of all, you've let you've yourself, let yourself down, down, Daz. Do you know what? Do you know what? in my mind I'm going mention Villa, mention Villa, yeah, mention yeah. Villa. But, but it wouldn't come it. out. It wouldn't come out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. And and they've been tipped to uh to be a challenger this year. I, I think we talked about it. They'll be there or thereabouts. They're not they're not challenging to win the league. Although, I think a cup. I think a cup. Yeah, given what's happening at, at Liverpool and City this year, maybe it becomes a lot closer. So I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll talk about that in a bit. So the next game was Leicester versus Wolves, obviously. Uh, Thomas fancies Wolves, uh, and the scores we had were: I had two 0 Leicester, Thomas had two one Leicester, uh, and Darren had two one Leicester, and it finished one 0 Leicester. <laughs> uh, Vardy scored uh, the uh, but the the talking points, and he and he actually had two pens during the game. So he scored one penalty, he missed another one, um, but the big talking point was the handball yes. for the first penalty. Surely that is ridiculous. He's running. He's in a normal motion. Ball at his arm. Uh, actually, uh, and then as soon as he realises he's trying to get it out the way and, and go out of a natural motion, and they give a penalty. And when you listen to the commentary, I think it was Alan Smith who was doing the commentary, and he was straight away, he's like, oh, it's never a penalty. When they watched it in super slow motion, like, that's never a penalty. No way they're giving that. Next minute, they give the penalty. Yeah, it's a terrible decision. It's it's something really that needs to be looked at straight away. Uh, I'm sure I read somewhere over the weekend that the leader of UEFA or the president of UEFA has written, or has it written the right word? Yeah. To the leader of FIFA and asked them to, to immediately look at the handball rule and get it changed. Uh, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we don't have to see. I mean, the VAR's bad enough with the offsides, but these on balls are absolutely ridiculous. Never in a month of Sundays was that on ball. I also think, again, it comes down to that interpretation because the law says a deliberate movement towards the ball. They're not de deliberate movements towards the ball. The ball is struck at you quite close. You can't. No one's got that quick reactions to, to, to move out the way of that. But haven't they changed that this year, does? Haven't they changed yeah. because it was it, that was always the way it was. It was deliberate movements. Now what they're saying is anything that hits the arm below the end of the sleeve is handball. You see, which, which where, is even more ridiculous. Yeah, because what yeah. you'll find is, and, and you know, players in the box will almost hit, try and hit the hand or the arm. To get something, that's what will happen. And I, th I think it becomes down to, again, them trying to micromanage games and trying to, to make it more exciting, but actually they're making it worse because, yeah, we want to see goals, we want to see incidents, we want to see, you know, exciting play. But what we don't want to see is this stupid rules ruining the game. And well, that's what's happened. There was a lot of chat about uh, natural movements over the weekend. There was also yeah. a lot of chat about... And, and um, the, the players who, who, who got the handball against him are saying it. You're almost being pushed into a place where you have to defend with your arms behind your back, and it's not natural. You can't do it. We criticised for years, and I think Roy Keane was talking about this on, and Carragher was talking about it on, um, on Sky. They were saying, we criticised the European players for years <laughs> for doing it, you know, yeah. running in the area with their arms behind the back, because it's not natural. And now all of a sudden, you, you have to do that. And you're being pushed into a position where you're doing things that are, that are not going to help your game at all because they're trying to change what, what actually was not the problem with the rule. The problem with the rule was not the deliberate movement towards the ball because that's a good part of the rule. They shouldn't have taken that away. And yeah. then they've introduced this ridiculousness at the bottom of the sleeve. They've, just, they've <coughs> fixed the wrong problem. Yeah. And then yeah. VAR has made it even more complicated. The rules were changed years ago, Simon, just on what you said. The, the players in Europe were defending with Dan's behind the back. 
and FIFA didn't like the look of it. It just didn't look good for football in general. And, and the best defenders could defend properly because it's not natural. You don't move naturally when you're doing that. They changed the rules to stop it so that defenders could have their arms out. And unless you move to the ball on purpose with your arm, that's when the decision be made against you. For them to change this now, it's a complete and utter farce. That is never a penalty. It no. doesn't matter whether you support Leicester or don't. You can hold your hands up and say, you know, it, did, it wasn't a penalty. And I also, it's, just, it's just not good enough. I, I also think slowing it down makes it look worse. Yeah. Because you need to see that in real time. That's what you need to do. And slowing it down, it clearly hits the, the, the arm or the hand. But, but it's not in real time. And making it, going to see a slow motion of it, confirms that it hit the hand. Yes, it does. But we need to look and be sensible with these because it's just going to cause so many issues and it already has. Well, that's what Conor Cody said when he was being interviewed. He said, um, the reality is it hit his arm. He said, but going and watching it in slow motion makes it totally unnatural. How hard that ball is being hit, you're not. If yeah. you don't consider that, then all you see is in slow motion, a hand move up and the ball hits it. But, but yeah. that's, not, that's not what happens in the game. Yeah. And, and I think they, it also took away from what was a really good Wolves performance. They had some really good chances. Certainly could have drawn the game and probably could have won it. And then we come to the next game, which is the Man City-Liverpool game, and the same thing happens again. So Jesus scores, which was a good goal. Whether he meant that turn or not is another question entirely. Never, um, never. I don't think so. But uh, And then Salah scored, which was great. Uh, and the handball against Gomez for the penalty, which De Bruyne actually ended up missing. It's the first time I've seen someone miss the target with a penalty in a long time, by the way. Pulled but I think wide. subconsciously he knew it wasn't a pen. He's very honest, lad. Oh, shut up. <laughs> so anyway, that handball was literally exactly the same as Kilman's, and they were talking about that the pace at which that ball had been hit. There's no way, because Gomez, as soon as he realised what was happening, he pulls his arm back, but it it obviously hit him just under the elbow here. So when he was interviewed after the game, he said, I'm not disputing the fact that it hit my arm. It did hit my arm. But how am I meant to run? He said, I'm yeah. running back and trying to get my body in the way of the ball. I'm upright. I'm running in a natural movement. And they're giving him a penalty against me. I don't know how to defend. And he was talking about the hands behind the back thing as well. Yeah, you, you're almost putting straight jackets on defenders as soon yeah. as they get into the 18 yard. We don't want to see that. And it's the power these balls are hit, the speed they hit. So you can't move your hand. Again, a complete farce. But it was always going to be given because the early game we'd given it. Of course. And that had been played in the referees and, and VIR's mind anyway. Yeah. You know? So it's just, it's just a shame. The two was, there was a little bit more distance between Gomez's Definitely. and Kilman's. Uh, the distance the ball travelled was a little bit further. Uh, I still didn't think it was a penalty. But I knew as soon as it hit his arm that going to give they, it. they were going to give it. And even though the commentators are saying, you know, it's not a penalty, as soon as he's called over, you know it's going to be given because they've got no choice because the rules are wrong. It's not. It's how the rules are interpret- it's interpreted is, is wrong r- r- with regards to the ball hitting your hand. It's, not, it's, it's just a joke. It's a farce. And it could have ruined, uh, a, a, you know, a great result for Liverpool on the day. Well, it was just... just- it, go on, Dad. I was just going back to that. I thought the first half was very good. Yeah. Second half, it didn't quite live up to expectations. Um, but I do think um, Liverpool and, and City both both were, were were going for it in the first half. But now, whether towards the end they were they were almost subconsciously looking for saying, well, "Okay, we're happy with the point and we're happy with the draw." I don't know. But one of the points I want to bring up, so I don't know if it's worth bringing up now, is that both of these managers wanted to introduce the five subs. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, that's one of the, the things we wanted to talk about. Um, let's get through the game and then we'll, okay. uh, we'll save that for later on because I think that's a, that's a good thing for us to go through as well because it definitely impacted this game. But I totally agree with you. I thought Liverpool, I, I actually don't think City were as good in the first half. I thought Liverpool were outstanding in the first half. Yeah. We had them backs against the wall, certainly for the first 25 minutes. They came into the game a bit more later on. But first half, I'd say, was definitely Liverpool's and was probably as, as well as we played for a while. Second half, first 15 minutes was okay, but it was a typical start to a second half. And then I totally agree with you. I think at, at like 30 minutes to go, the, the teams had even subconsciously settling for it, passing yeah. the ball across the back more, not getting the ball into midfield and penetrating the, the defence. It, it just, it almost turned into, everyone was like Jamie Redknapp. Everyone's passing sideways consistently. You're like, well, 
are we going to go after this game or what? Because if someone had gone after the game, if a team had gone after the game, they'd have probably won it. But yeah, I think the, they were happy with the points at that stage. Yeah, I think the tempo in the game just dropped. And, and I think, but I think City's tempo in most games hasn't been great. I think, I think they've, um, they're almost playing in second gear. They've not quite reached the, the heights they have previously. And I don't know whether that's because the clientele up front. I don't know whether it's because the clientele in the midfield has moved on. But they don't look as sharp. They don't look as fluent. They don't look as fit. And it's very pedestrian, the play. It's almost like, well, we go to the left, then we pass it back, and we move across, and we go to the right. Then we pass it back, and we move across, and go to the left. There's no sharpness of two, three, four short passes to, to bring the, the other team in. Then the big switch and the shift across. There's I, yeah. none of that at the moment with City. I think there are three reasons for that. One is um, they were scared of what, was going to, what Liverpool were going to do. I think Liverpool suffered from that in the second half as well. Um, but also Silva not being there and Aguero not playing. I, I think that changes their formation. Yeah, I just want to pick up on the start and Liverpool's starting lineup. I, I texted you both uh, when I seen the lineup at the start of the game to say, how brave is this lineup for Liverpool? I'm starting the, 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 the front four now, as we're going to call, as it might be called, instead of the famous front three with Jota. Yeah, we Jota. say, Thomas, do we say the Fab Four? We, no, we don't say that because they're the Beatles, aren't they, Darren? <laughs> yeah, be careful. <laughs> it's copyrighted. Uh, how brave was it of Klopp to take a midfielder out and play them four forwards? Uh, and the movement and the fluidity between Liverpool. Uh, their, their front players in the midfield, and including the full-backs as they pushed right on, in that first half an hour, was out of this world. And Liverpool looked absolutely electric. They, they were fierce. Everything they did was with pace and aggression. They were outstanding. Best they played for, for a long time. I'd seen them in that first half against City. And second half, I thought, and I, I, I've not said this for a long time, they looked exhausted. They looked like the legs had gone. And then obviously we had a couple of injuries and we had to change, we tried to change tactically a couple of things with Shaqiri coming on. But Liverpool looked absolutely knackered. And City, for all the quality that they possess and the, the, the millions and millions that they've got on the bench, you know, probably the best squad in, in the league when you look at man for man, I thought they were, they were lucky to go in, you know, with, as it was at half time, one all. And then second half was a board draw and they just played it out to get the uh, to get the, the, the game over and the one all they were happy both sides. Yeah, I but think just the, on that Thomas. Oh sorry, go on say. I, I was I was just gonna say I, th I think the, the board draw in the second half was was probably a product of we were feeling the the the, the, the momentum from the first half and we're just tired. This five, five subs issues definitely comes into play as well, and you and you're seeing Klopp and Pep talking about it, and then also City thinking, actually, we've been hammered there in the first half. We'll take a one-one draw here. I, I mean, I I watched the game, but how many really clean cut chances were there in the game that you would say that should have gone in? First, first, uh, I think the first twenty minutes, I mean, you had a couple of chances, and there's a few more throughout, but it, it was the first half. Yeah, there wasn't ones where you'd go, that should have been in. There was half chances, maybe, yeah. you'd argue. Yeah. But, but it, there wasn't a chance where you go, that should have been in. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a strange game. All right, we'll, we'll talk about this five subs thing in a bit. Uh, but the last game, Daz, and I know you're going to be very interested in this one, uh, was Arsenal versus Villa. And let's just have a look at the scores that we have for this. So yeah, let's I just had, look at the scores, Si. I had 2-0 for Arsenal. Thomas had 4-0 for Arsenal. He said that the fella would be crap. And you're crap, as he said at the same time. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> Darren, you had 2-1 to Villa. Although, I've got to say that if you go and listen to the audio again from last week, Daz, you were certainly not confident. In fact, I think you said Arsenal are going to win, but I have to back Villa. Yeah, and, and it goes with my heart. I need to go with my heart more. I need to, um, I need to put in. Did you watch this game, Darren? Yes, I did. Did you watch it? Did you pay the fourteen ninety five uh, pay per view fee for this game, Darren? Don't no, answer. No. What What I did is my neighbour did, and he opened the window and the blinds for me, Excellent. and I watched it from well from done, there. Guys. He's got a big screen. Oh, okay. All right. I'll let you off then. Crack on then, Darren. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Um, so two top teams going for battle of the of the Sundays. Um, Arsenal, great side. 
I had momentum, going to be up there when the season finishes against the Villa side, who are probably the best Villa side I've seen for a number of years. Um, head to head, the battle of the Sundays. You can forget the other games, but they weren't worth watching. <laughs> but um, to be fair, um, I was coming into this game a little bit apprehensive. I thought we'd lost two against teams we should be really getting something out of. With Arsenal, you don't know which Arsenal team are going to turn up. They've been excellent against the Man Cities and one or two other sides, but then poor in, in other games. And I think what we did very well in this game is started off on the front foot. and We started with um, pace. We started with aggression. Um, the first goal, it should have been a goal, but I can see why it wasn't given, if I'm being honest. I think that John McGinn, the guy, the goalkeeper for Arsenal, was never going to get that. Um, but I can see why they decided against it. But actually, Villa, I've been going about the system at Villa for probably 18 months now. But if you watch the game, what, what they did very well, I thought, Villa, they played a 4-4-2 when they, when they were defending. Barkley played almost like um, a second striker for most of the game, up with Watkins, who Watkins, by the way, was outstanding. His hold-up yeah, play. Good. We haven't had a striker who can hold a play up like that for three or four years um, and I think what he does do, he allows then the play to move forward onto him. And he holds the play up very well. His movement's good. He's got a good touch. He's strong. And he'll run all day. And isn't he and, an ex-Arsenal uh, player? Didn't he play for Arsenal? He, he, he was uh, on there as a, as a youth guy. Yes, or he's, yeah. a, he's a massive fan anyway. He was, yeah, his yeah. whole family and Arsenal fans. Um, and so when we were defending, we, we were almost going into a 4-4-2. A conventional 4-4-2, which helped because normally we get done out wide. And I think that really helped us. I thought... Uh, Grealish, you know, was outstanding. I thought Brilliant. that the the second goal, I think it was, uh, where he got it off the goalkeeper and, and he ran 50, 60, 70 yards. And I was thinking, what is he going to get the weight of the pass right? And he did. And Watkins, great left foot, great goal. It was the third goal, actually, because the second goal was Barkley's ball across. Was, yeah. And now Barkley played better because he wasn't after doing all the work to get tired. You know, I, I don't think he's the fittest player. In, in the world, so what he has to do is he has to be clever with his runs and by saying to him you don't have to come back and defend and we're going to play a, a conventional 4-4-2 allowed him to, to, to save his energy and get involved when he needed to get involved but I think that was Barclay, really important Here's the issue with Barkley he's meant to be a midfielder and he was basically being treated like a luxury player and that worked really well for this game and they looked brilliant, he looked really good Grealish was outstanding. Watkins was outstanding. They looked really strong across the back as well. Arsenal didn't have much to, to offer in terms of attack. But in the games where you need Barkley to dig in, I think that's where you're going to struggle. Unless it is I a totally agree. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's, it's when we played the, the Southampton game, he struggled because they were fitter and wolf runners in midfield. Yeah. I think um, what I'm disappointed with with Arsenal is um, Aubameyang keeps playing on the left. Yeah. It's almost like he doesn't get involved enough in the game. And I don't know whether that's just because that's where he wants to play and he's not going to change him. But I'd almost like to see him playing in the centre. I'd almost yeah. like to see him being the, the main striker and everyone feeding into him or feeding off him. I think he's wasted out on the left. Um, but that might be where he wants to play. And, and you know, where contracts yeah. are these days, that might be in his contract. But I do think Arsenal got it totally wrong against Villa. I think I said to them, I said to us on the previous podcast, Villa were always going to play counter attack uh, against Arsenal. Arsenal going to have the lion's share, but actually, Arsenal's passing was so yeah. slow and so poor and, and not accurate enough. And then once you start off like that, it's hard to get going. You know, Villa started off as I said, high tempo on the front foot, and you can sustain that. What you can't do in games is start slow and gradually get into it because the other team could be two or three nil up. Um, but what I will say as well is Matty Cash. Uh, who plays right back for, for Villa, has been outstanding all season. He's quick, he's strong, he's good in the air, he's clever with his play. I'm really impressed with him. I didn't know much about him, but actually I think he's been our best player so far this season. Yeah. Well, then, one thing I picked up on, the disallowed goal, John McGinn's feet for the goal, with just the little touch and they get it in the space. What a, what a lovely little player he is. And now that he's, I'm glad he's back to fitness. Uh, Villa thoroughly deserved the win. Uh, just how many dives did Grealish do? Two, carry on. It, it was ridiculous. I do think that he is... There are some bad players who are bad for this in the Premier League, but he is right up there. He's the worst. Uh, so, basically, what happens is 
um, because he doesn't play for Liverpool, you're having a go at him because he dives. I think that's the issue here. <laughs> now, Thomas, you've you had have... Villa. You've had enough on Villa. We're going to move on. I'm just going to leave on this. <laughs> he is absolutely useless. When he gets touched, he throws himself down with his little stupid tiny shin pads around his ankles. You tried so hard not to swear. Yeah, well done. I did, and say other things as well. He is a disgrace. Stay on your feet. He's now showing us the talent that he's got. Uh, he's dominating games, he's creating chances, and he's helping Villa win games. He doesn't need all that theatrics to go with it. It takes away from his performance. And it actually gives the likes of Southgate, who we don't give two monkeys about, it gives him something to look at to say, do you know what, I'll have Madison in there instead, or I'll have Mount in there. He, or Barnes, who's coming through, he can't. You know, he needs to start to cut that out of his game. And then will people will start looking, other teams around the league will start looking at him going, do you know what? He is the player that other t- that the press are talking about now. Now, move on. <laughs> Go on, Dad, you can have the last word. Well, all the crap. I've never heard so much crap <laughs> in all my life. <laughs> all right, let's move on. All right, so uh, so the, you brought it up before, Dad, and it, it's, a, it's a bigger issue, uh, but it came out after the the Liverpool City game, this five subs issue. So Klopp and Pep were talking after the game about the fact that we need this five subs. Every other big league has it. We don't. What's your take? Thomas, do you want to go first? Uh, I, I can see both sides of the coin. I can see the fact that the smaller clubs with less resources who haven't got the, the depth of quality that the bigger teams have got are saying the big teams are crying it in because they they want to share their players and they're playing so many games because of being in the Champions League, uh, and they want to try and put decent, you know, the best players save the best players for the big games. I understand that. I also understand, like the Sheffield United, they have come out and said that we totally reject it. Uh, when you have the ball of games over the season, you're playing the same amount of games as the teams in the Championship, and. They're not crying about muscle injuries. Get over it and get on with it. You just want it so that you can, you know, be better and have a bigger squad and use more better players than we can afford down the bottom end of the league. I think our top players, and certainly at Liverpool, where I can only because I watch them the most, we play the same eight or nine every single week. So we don't give the likes of Trent a rest. We don't give Andy Robinson a rest. Mane, if he's fit, plays every game, so does Salah. Jordan Henderson is on a programme now where he plays once a week or he plays one and a half games a week. They won't let him play two full games because they're worried about injury. Uh, and every game, obviously, when you're, you're, you're up there challenging, is really important, like it is for the teams down the bottom. I'm not taking that away from them. But if they then wanted to want us to go and then and impress and keep the numbers up in Europe and have a top of challenging for the big trophies across the world, They've got to give us the five players, five subs, like the other leagues have. This is a condensed season. We're playing so many weeks shorter, and then we've got a European Championship to contend with. We're going to have massive injury problems, all teams, coming that, going after Christmas. And then we've got the big Christmas rush coming up. I just totally agree with what they're saying. I think we should have five subs. Go on, Daz. I disagree. I don't think we should. Um, and, and, you know, Villa are a big team as well, Thomas. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, well, I'm glad um, you've supported your own team there. That's thanks, right. but I, had to, I thought I'd get that in. I think, I think Sheffield United have made an excellent point. And I think um, five years ago, there was a lot of squad rotation. There isn't as much now. So why is that? Because the, the, play, the teams haven't got the squads they want. But I, I just look and I think it's the same teams who are moaning up they want elitism. They're moaning about they want five subs. They want to protect themselves. They don't really care about everyone else. They just want to make sure that they're looked after themselves. And all this business about those five subs, how many times has Klopp and how many times has Pep used three subs in a game? It's not many. It's not many. And when you look at it, you're thinking, well, if you use your three subs in every game, you, you could support your argument. But their argument falls because they only use one sub. Do you know why that is, Darren? I'll, I'll tell you why that is. So Liverpool used two subs, didn't they, Saturday? And did Pep use one sub? Yeah. Uh, the reason why Liverpool didn't use the third sub was because they were worried about injuries right across the pitch. They had players struggling 
they couldn't afford to take one of them off with 10, 15 minutes to go because they were worried that someone else was going to drop. They, had, they, were, they were waiting on three players that they weren't sure were going to get through the game. Yeah, but Thomas... So they, used to, they were unable to use the third one in case they needed it. Yeah, but Thomas, that happens in every game. That could happen. You don't know. If you use your three subs, I think Mourinho uses three subs once at, at half-time. He made that decision. Yeah. But, I, but, but, but I do think you don't know when the next player's going to get injured. It could be a, a foul come in, a tackle come in. You could get, you, that'll be it. But I do think it's, again, that City and Liverpool are showing this elitism that I just don't agree with. I think they, they have enough of a squad. That's why they have a squad. Now, if the quality of the players aren't there, that's no one else's problem. The, the, the thing is, you have three subs. If you use all three subs, you rest them three players. There's nothing stopping Liverpool or Man City rotating their squads if they think they're good enough. There's nothing. The problem is they won't. And then they moan that they want to swap. It's tactically a decision that they want to do it for. And that's what I believe. Of course. Uh, you just said something there, Daz, which I think is, is almost like stating the obvious. Uh, they don't care about anyone else. Well, of course they don't. They care about themselves. They don't care about anyone else. And yeah. I think that's... Neither I mean, they shouldn't. We've talked about this actually quite a lot uh, during this period. It's, it's a business. Um, it's all about their club. It's not about anyone else. I think what's happened over recent weeks has, has shown that as well with um, the with the the this European Super League or whatever it is, Super Premier League or whatever it is. And I think this is another one of those situations where they're just going to look after themselves. As, as far as five subs are concerned, that would be great for Liverpool and City and some of the other top sides. But, you know, for the clubs that lower down and they're not going to use the fourth and, fourth and fifth sub at all. So, it, you know, it's not going to work for them. Don't have players that are available and good enough to put in those positions. What I do think is, is that for the bigger clubs, it might give us more of an option to use some of the kids in those uh, fourth and fifth sub positions and get them minutes on the pitch. Uh, we'd have definitely, if we'd have had five subs at the weekend, I think Klopp probably would have used a third and maybe a fourth. Uh, but, the reality is it would benefit the club that I support and, and I think that would be a good thing. However, I can totally see why if you're a Sheffield United, you'd be saying... Or a Villa. Or, <laughs> one more, Thomas. Well, I, one I, more. I don't want to I mean, fall it does over it, uh, but I, 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 I think that the reality is, is that if you're one of, one of those lower clubs, a West Brom, a Sheffield United, you, you're not going to want it. I think, Simon, the issue is it's, it's 11 a side game. If you're choosing five subs... Half of that team, so half your outfield players are getting moved. Tactically, you can do so much within that. You can only yeah. do, we always do so much now with three subs, but five tactically, and that benefits the top clubs. Yeah, definitely. And and, and you know they they play the Premier League. Seeing as well a top club, does I don't see why you've got an issue with it. Yeah, because 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 what I tend to do is look at the big picture, Simon. I don't know if oh, Thomas has mentioned that. I don't, because we were, I'm going to shock you now, we were at relegation last year. And so I know what it was like because we didn't have the players to do it. And I think, I think you're looking at it again and you're thinking, if Klopp and, and, and Pep are so concerned, rotate your squad. Okay. Thanks for that, Daz. Yeah. I think Daz has just blown a gasket. Yeah, um, yeah. So the other thing that relates to the five subs is the injuries that are going on at the moment. And... Uh, Liverpool are really struggling with it, but they're not the only team. Um, there's a lot of teams that are struggling with injuries. Do we think this is being driven by the uh, shortened pre-season, less time off, uh, more compressed season as well, sort of playing more games? I, I get your point, Daz, about bigger bigger squads, but it seems to be impacting a lot of teams as well. It's not just the Liverpool's and Man City's. This is a, this is a bigger issue. It's just, obviously, it's a bit more visible when it's your Liverpool's and Man City's. Um, I, I look at it thinking these guys play two games a week and they, they rest and they train and they're all on programmes they're, they're all on the programmes to be the fittest they can be in the peak for those games I, I, I don't understand why, why they moan about the, the doing too much I know lots of players who would rather play in the week than train I'm one of them, you're probably one of them Si Absolutely. yeah um, and, and I do think if you're playing Saturday or a Sunday and then playing a Wednesday, what's the issue? Because you'll, that's, that's the, the season is. For me, I, I look around and I'm thinking, 
you'll probably have a Monday rest day or you'll be on a program. Tuesday, you'll do a little bit of light work. It's not like they're running nine to five every single day, to, to, unless you're leads, to, to, um, <laughs> to, to, to then go out and play. Or they're not nine to five training and playing in the night at half seven. These are all on a, a program by, by fitness gurus to make sure they peak at the right time. You're going to get injuries throughout, and I get fatigue, I get all that. But actually, I also get that these guys are all eating the right foods, they're all preparing the right way. These are professional athletes. They're not like Joe Bloggs, who, who works nine to five, goes training Tuesdays and Thursdays and plays Saturdays. Well, as the, the difference does between what we do and the fact that we would like to play a second game during the week, um, I run in a game probably about 7K a game, maybe eight. Um, I'd probably put you down for two, maybe. Um, but these, meters, meters, <laughs> meters, yeah. Kilometers does. <laughs> uh, these professionals, some of these players are running 12 and 13K a game intervals. The pressure that puts on your body is massive. Now, I definitely fall more on your side on this, I think. Get on with it. You're professional footballers. That's your job. I'd rather play than train. You should be okay. But I think the way the game has changed and the way it's become much more athletic, I think that's what's putting the pressure on people. And I get that. But if you look at the game, if you and, and you're talking about intervals and that, that short sprint, and then, but but also they do just a lot of walk around and little light jogs because that's the way the game's played. And then they do that burst of sprint or they do a long sprint to, to go from one end to the other it's not like the sprinting for 90 minutes and, and i'm being you know a little bit you know i shared that aren't you i am but i just don't get it these are athletes they have marathon runners who, who run um every single night or every other night and they, they go out and they run 26 miles of a weekend and it's like these guys i get that, that they are getting injured and when you get um when you get to a certain peak then your muscles are stretched to the maximum, and that's when they're gonna have have issues. But don't come at me and say we're tired and we're gonna get injured because we're playing two games a week. It's ridiculous. Darren, you only have Down to look with at the kids, Darren. And don't Italy. come at me. Hey, you look at me, Darren. I am at the peak of physical fitness, and how many injuries I pick up. Well, I mean, yeah. I wish I wish we had a full body shot now because. And then yeah. people can make up their own mind what the peak of physical fitness is. Yeah, Simon, I'm glad we haven't got a full body shot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm carrying a bit of uh, COVID crisis weight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's been four years now, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what do you think, Tom? Do you think it, they're, they're being impacted by the shortened season? Yeah, so I, short I definitely do think. And the shortened pre-season. Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, it was funny, we were, I, I don't know who I was talking to the day about Trent. Uh, he didn't start the season very well. And we were talking about why we thought that and for how well he played last year. And he said he got an injury in pre-season, so he didn't train the very short... Was it a two-week pre-season? Yeah. Uh, he, he got an injury in pre-season, he didn't train. And then when we started the first game, he'd come in without the two weeks, which doesn't seem a lot, to be honest. Then... He played for a few weeks, and to be honest, he just didn't see him at the races. And then I've noticed the last couple of weeks, his performances have been getting better and better. Uh, he's been getting him down the pitch a lot better. And then to the point where he's got himself right up to the, the, the peak of his powers, uh, fitness-wise, he's probably doing the most distance, uh, more sprints in a game. His, de- his body then goes. You, you can't just constantly, constantly batter yourself. Uh, and if that's what they're doing, I understand what Darren's saying. They've got the best of everything. They get the best foods, the best everything. I understand that, but you're only human. Your body can only allow you to do so much. And then you do break down. You do get soft muscle injuries. You do uh, see people going over and the balance goes and like Danny Ings doing his knee and stuff. Mm. These injuries, even though they do happen in normal seasons when we have proper pre-seasons and whatnot, I still think that we're putting them through too much. It's uh, it's hard to see, isn't it? When you're not a pro, you know we we all we'd all love to be professional footballers, and and you look at it and you think, well, oh, I'd quite happily play two games a week, three games four. I don't care. I'd rather play a game a day as opposed to training. But I just think it's it's hard to really know what the impact is like when you when you're at that level of athleticism in in any sport. Um, and we're just jealous at the end of the day. So. I can see you looking at me there, Sai, si, and, and I obviously you're a, could you're have a played pro. You're a mathlete, Daz. I don't know about I, an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> you are very good but, at maths. But, yeah, but, but I, I do, I do 
worry because if this conversation was going on in March and April next year, I'd probably understand more because you think it, it has been a long season in, in, in condensed season. But this is talking about in November when they had pre-season for two weeks and then they gradually got into games because the games weren't great to begin with. Uh, you know, they're all quite slow and all quite boring and then suddenly it picked up because they are playing regularly and getting fit and it's coming along. And then we're in November saying they're tired. Oh, bless them. They just yeah. had three months off of COVID. All right, so Darren is basically, I think Thomas mentioned Scrooge earlier. Uh, Scrooge earlier, and I think Darren has actually taken on the role in this episode. So let's get to something that is going to entertain the masses, Tom. Um, so okay. last week, the, the thing that really got people going, and apparently uh, the reason we got 1,249 of the 1,250 views that we got yeah. was your French, or I don't know what language it was actually, uh, your attempt at speaking another language in your wall of fate. So let's get to the wall of hate and who are you mostly hating this week? But can I just ask, who did, you know, do either of you speak French? No. I, I hear uh, French. Un, un, French petit pas, un petit pas. So, you know, how did you know that it wasn't any good? Just because people have put on social media, people aren't nice on social media. Yeah, but hang on. The people who said you weren't very good are all French. <laughs> <laughs> so the, issue, the issue there is... It might just be my accent. Scouser talking French. Mm, I don't think so. No, it might just be me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm going to believe the French speaking natives, to be honest, mate. They, uh, they are native French speakers. I'm going to believe them over you. Okay. Uh, so this week, I'm mostly hating someone who doesn't even go by his real name. He's won all the major club honours you can win as a coach and as a player. He is considered as one of the best managers and coaches of all time and holds the record for the most consecutive leagues won in the Liga, the Bundesliga and the Premier League. This week, I'm mostly hating Joseph Salah Ooh. or Pep Guardiola. Ah. Friends. <laughs> Buenas noches, mi amigo. So, he was an average defensive midfield player who spent the majority of his career playing with the best players at Barcelona under the brilliant and much better player and coach, Johan Cruyff. At least Johan has a turn named after him, but I forgot what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Once he left Barcelona as a player, he didn't do much because he was bang average. I'm not playing with great players anymore. He retired and returned to the comforts of Barcelona and coached Barcelona B. And because of the so-called success that he had with that team, he took over Barcelona's first team in 2008. In his first season, he guided Barcelona to the treble. But anyone could have done that with that team he inherited. They were amazing. Even I could have won with that team. And now look at me. I'm stuck with Liverpool over South Liverpool over 40s. <laughs> After a short break from football, because he was found out as a coach, he arrived in the Bundesliga to manage Bayern Munich. He left one easy league to go to another easy league. You know, there are only two teams in Germany, Bayern Munich and... Sorry, there's only one team in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> they do it on a cold, rainy night in Stoke. Turns out he could when he moved to mega rich Man City after inherit. After inheriting great teams in his previous two jobs and turning them into average teams, could he do it again at City? Again, his timing was perfect to City. Although he had a good side and other Premier Leagues were going through, you know, I'd say a transition period, they managed to scrape enough points to win the league. Everyone made a big deal about how he broke, broke records by getting 100 points. Listen, I've got 100 points on my driving licence, but no one says anything about that. <laughs> His transfers have been shocking at times, and he has spent well over 400 million on defenders at City. It would have been a lot easier and a lot cheaper if he had used his connections in the Far East to bribe the opposition strikers to miss the goal. The longer he's at the club, the worse the club gets. And if I was a City fan, and thank God I'm not, and I mean that, I would be hoping he leaves after this season so they can get back to winning ways. 
uh, and back to winning leagues and hopefully build that side back up. So for finally being found out as an average coach and for wanting to be more like Klopp and Liverpool, Joseph, Joseph, Pep, Fraudiola, Salah, you are now on my wall of hate. Yes. Uh, good Thomas? One. Yeah? Who was Johan Cruff? <laughs> Cruff. <laughs> Did you do the dog show? You mentioned the dog show. (laughs) (laughs) Brilliant. I can't remember the name of the turn. That was good. (laughs) But yeah, um, you you know, we'll have made uh, Paddy O'Hanlon happy with that because he's uh, he's a big hater of Pep Guardiola. Yeah, it's a good one. That I think he's uh, he's he's someone you love to hate, isn't he? Yeah. Do you know what I also think? You know when you see like really bad makeup in movies where what's Uncle Festa where like yeah. the guy plays him and he's got like a, a bald head glued onto his over his hair. He looks like that. His head just looks like he's just <laughs> yeah. He doesn't look good. No, um, yeah, and, and he joking aside, he's done some amazing things in football, but he does after a few years wreck teams. He yeah. runs them to the ground and he can't build a side. He's always inherited good sides. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens next with him. All right, guys. Probably end up in the Welsh league, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, you know, once you've once you've been in the La Liga, the Bundesliga, Premier League, won all these trophies, why wouldn't you go to the Welsh league? Yeah, it's only one way to go, then, isn't it? Exactly. Going to Juventus. (laughs) The only way is up. He's definitely not getting the uh, South Liverpool job. I'll tell you that for nothing. No, no no chance. Not a chance because your dad is next for that, apparently. Apparently so, yeah, taking over Thomas, yeah. And I retire. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff supported by Sean McCusker. Of oh, God, Thomas. <laughs> that, hey, that, that's the dream team, isn't it? That's Imagine <laughs> the team talk. Oh, my, your crap, your crap, your crap. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're never a centre mid, go centre half. <laughs> yeah. You're never and a left back, I want you to go right wing. Sean McCusker, I'm playing in goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, all right, let's get to uh, the quizzy quiz type quiz question, Daz. What have you got for us this week? Right, a little bit of research this week, and it's um, a two-part question. So, it's which Premier League team had the most Premier League away draws in a season, and what was the season? Mm. So, which Premier League team had the most Premier League away draws in a season, and what was the season? No way. Thomas has got it already. Every it's week. so every you know week. What's funny? When you put the question up on Facebook, he never puts the right answer. <laughs> he I never comments. I don't, I don't <laughs> want to spoil it for all you know, for the people out there. Yeah. So we just the brains. Be, we just have to believe you. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. So uh, it was a it was a good week. Plenty of goals. Plenty plenty of controversy. Um, that and being argumentative, which we all love. Bob O'Ring will be happy with that because he thinks you we've started agreeing with, with each other far too much. Um, so he'll enjoy this this uh, this episode. Uh, Daz, do you want to give us some final thoughts before we go on this yeah, well, international too, weekend? On this international weekend, you know, it's I think there's an issue with Denmark as well at the moment. And anyway, I, I just want to say um, we're into the second week of lockdown. You know, give this a listen. Give us a message. We interact with people. You know, sometimes when you're sitting at home. Just throw something on our Facebook page or our Twitter, and we get back to you. We can have a bit of a bit of banter, and it just helps everyone during these difficult times. And also, it's uh, Remembrance Day today, so to our soldiers who are fighting for us, uh, thank you very much. Good shout out, Daz. Thomas, how about you? A uh, bit of history this week, boys, that we didn't touch on in the podcast. It was the closing of the doors of Melwood, uh, and some of the greatest footballers that have graced the planet. I've gone through that site, uh, Daglish, Barnes, Rush, Fowler, Stephen Gerrard, to name Sean a few. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to touch on it just for a second, just to say, what a place, uh, and just been amazing. I've got some great memories of Melwood. We used to go there and wait outside for the players, and they'd be coming out the gates in their fancy cars, and we used to get on each other's shoulders and watch over the wall while they were training. What an amazing place that was. As you say, there's been some amazing footballers there. It was where they, uh, they built Liverpool Football Club up. Uh, great, great history. And it was good to see so much nostalgia this week from people like Klopp and 
Van Dijk, yeah. you know, the, the new crop of Liverpool, Liverpool players. Daz, did you ever play there? Uh, I think once. I think I played there once. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I did, yeah. Do you know what's a shame? It's going to go to houses. I would like to have seen it still stay as a sports, something to do with sports, football, that local finals could be played at. I just think it's a, it's a shame. It is because the setup was fantastic as well. Yeah. Yeah. I but, think Liverpool got close to 10 million quid for it, though. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that, didn't we? There's, it's a, although it would be the great thing to do for the city, the reality is that it's a business and yeah. they're going to sell it on. All right, well, listen, I really enjoyed that. Um, so please visit the website at www.3menandfootball.com. Uh, download the um, podcast at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, tune in uh we're all over the place uh or watch us on youtube also visit facebook instagram twitter give us your feedback get involved in the conversation give us some comments uh for the podcast and make them as funny as you want you can even make them up although i didn't make any of them up today they were all real and uh, we'll be sending that legal letter over to you thomas all right thanks lads have a great week take care see you later see bye, bye.